All right, guys, welcome back to Cry About It, the saddest podcast in all the land. Today, we have a very special guest from legendary skate punk band from up north, our Canadian brothers, Belvedere. Now, we're going to jump right into the interview in a minute, but first, got to take care of a little bit of business. Today's podcast is brought to you by Stage West, Scranton's number one music venue. Those guys are back in it. They're back open. Regulations are lifting here in Pennsylvania. They have a ton of great shows coming up. Make sure you get out there right now. They're open for drinks and food and everything, and then the shows are starting, and they're going to be announcing them very soon. So make sure you go check out StageWest570.com. Check out their sister venue in State College, Stage West State College. Let's jump into it. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. I don't know how much you, you know about the podcast. We're based on sad music, emo, and pop mm-hmm. punk, but also uh, we've had a couple guests in the kind of the skate punk lane and our fans have really enjoyed it so i'm very excited to have you here thank you no that's awesome um I, i'm excited to hear that you're from pennsylvania because that was uh that was a good spot for us um we used to tour pa quite a bit back in the uh, early 2000s so uh it's good good to meet you belvedere's always been a name that i've been super aware of i've definitely seen you guys a couple times on some other shows and uh it's uh, like i want to say the first time i heard the name was probably around like two 2001, 2000, uh, Warp Tour? Yeah, 2001, we did Pittsburgh and we did um, Camden, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. No, we did, what was it? Yeah, we did a bunch of dates. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's blurry, but I know we did. We did Pittsburgh and I know we did one right in the Philly border there. I don't think it was right in Philadelphia. I think it, yeah, I can't remember exactly, but yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that was kind of like the, the first of, of quite a few times back to PA after that. What was it like in the early days? So like I'm, I, we're we're probably similar age. I I kind of got into this genre of music uh, like my sophomore year of high school. So probably right around 2001, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of when you guys were popping off. And you were on Warp Tour at that time. What what was mm-hmm. Warp Tour like back then? Well, you're, I think you're being nice. I'm, I think I'm a, a good chunk older than you to be, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, we so we started in '95. So okay. um, the uh, right when I got out of high school, I think I was just getting into college, and we started then. And um, yeah, we didn't really have a lot of hopes or dreams for anything, really. We just thought we'd play some shows, and then the circle kind of got bigger and bigger the more, uh, you know, the more uh, shows that we did on the weekends. We started touring the States in 97 or 98, and, uh, you know, mostly just like basement shows and whoever would have us. We did a tour with Bad Religion in 99 across Canada, and that sort of led us to meeting some people at the Warp Tour, and then that's, you know, we, we had 206 Records out of Seattle, which was our label at the time. And then we, we ended up going to Jumpstart Records, which was based out of State College. And so anytime we would do a Canadian tour, we'd always dip down and we'd do a good two weeks, three weeks kind of around the northeast of the, of the states before we started making our way west. So um, it was just a lot of like hard hitting, you know, touring, a lot of small shows, basement shows. And then sometimes we'd run into like Strung Out or Big Wig or um you know bands like that where the shows were were even better so um you know it was pretty much like that until about 2001 or two when things kind of picked up for us a bit and we started going overseas to europe and japan and south america and it just kind of steamrolled little baby steps you know every time but what what did you find um as far as like the musical difference between in the states and and over in europe as you were touring well yeah yeah we did I think it was our third ter- third time over with uh, going to Europe where we got on Gros Rock. And the first the first time we did, uh, we went over with Satanic Surfers. I We had done a tour with Canada, made friends with them, and they brought us over for nine shows. And then, you know, in the meantime, our label here had some friends in Switzerland and hooked us up with a couple of No Use for Name and Pulley shows. Well, then that led us to being friends with those bands. And then Pulley took us over a year later, and then we were able to headline sort of after that. And uh, then followed up with a Mad Caddies tour. So it was just like kind of like step, step, step. And, you know, every time we went over there, it was it was really great. Like, you know, I love touring the States, but Europe is is kind of on its own level. You know, and I, I know you probably hear a lot of American bands as well as Canadian bands saying, you know, Europe's where it's at. And it's it's there's so many people there, but they have such a healthy music scene because, you know, you're allowed to have all these outdoor festivals every week. There's a festival you know, for six months of the year in every country. So there's a really good, and you know, obviously drinking laws are different and stuff. Basically, if you're over 15, nobody cares if you have a beer in your hand. So it's like parents are bringing their kids to the show. So you always have this kind of influx of younger kids coming into the scene that are listening to punk and hardcore metal and stuff like that. So, um, you know, we definitely have festivals like that in the States and Canada, but it's just so, you know, prolific over there. 
so it's they're very supportive and it's and it's and it's super great to, to tour there you mentioned the mad caddies that was one uh on my list that uh and i also saw you guys toured with no uh no effects at one point yeah. too or did some shows with them right we did some shows with them yeah actually somewhat recently about three or four years ago i always find it interesting because there's touring as far as the canadian bands coming across to the united states right when when you're touring in contrast to canada and the united states is it uh are you doing a lot of just canadian tours or are you usually coming across and doing some dates in the u.s as well well first of all off you know back when we were younger you're right you could get across with a with a, with a, a driver's license but right. you still as a band needed to have a work permit right. and that's the, the real sticking point why you're not seeing bands from canada come down as frequently um you know maybe you could get before 2001 you could you could maybe get uh you know you could do a little recording contract and record in the states you know and nobody you know as long as you didn't have any merch nobody gave you a hard time but We've been getting P2 visas since pretty much 2000. You know, it's expensive. It's thousands of dollars because you have to join a musician's union. You got to pay for Homeland Security to get a permit from them. And of course, they're always late. So then you got to pay an extra thousand bucks for, you know, a rush. And, and so it can be really te tedious. And, you know, for bands that are playing bigger venues, then they withhold a bunch of money from you for foreign artist tax. So, you know, this is stuff that a lot of people don't know. And they ask me all the time, like, how come you don't tour the States that much? It's because it's actually easier for me to tour Russia than it is to tour the States. Right. It's cheaper for me to tour Europe than it is to tour the States. And that that's unfortunate because we have a lot of fans down there and we love touring the States. But for the last probably 10 years, because of kids and, and all this stuff, we can only go away for four or five dates. Well, it's really hard to make, you know, recoup all that. And you'll find that with a lot of Canadian bands, unless they can go for a couple of weeks or a month, it's pretty tough to do that. Um, that is changing for us now because we are more of a full-time band. And once we get over all these Europe stuff, that this Europe stuff that we have to make up, then we're coming back down to the States for the first time in 15 years. Um, so the end of, you know, end of 2022, you'll see us down there again, which, which I'm super excited about. We're excited to have you. And, and that's, I've been hearing that a lot. I work with, uh, we are sharks and I do a lot of shows with them. Um, yeah. they kind of told me the same thing that it's a little, it's, yeah, you're a promoter, you get it, right? Like yeah. it's, 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 it's a bit tricky, but you know, that being said, it is a little easier to tour the States in terms of distance because, um, you know, we've got a, a 10th of the population in a massive country. So, um, you know, we, we do a lot of eight to 10 hour drives, which, which totally licks. So, um, you know, doing those nice little two, three hours in, in the States is pretty awesome. To hear you say, like, you haven't been in the United States in 15 years, I think it speaks to how prolific the band's career is. There's not a lot of bands, especially in this scene, that started in 99 and are still out here doing it. What's kept you going all this time? I think just, you know, I, I've been in the punk scene for a long time. And I think it, yeah, it was the end of 94, early 95 when we started. I started as a, re I, I actually started a record label and I was putting out bands. and I thought I was just going to be the person behind the bands. And then I started playing and it was just like a, a switch went off. You know, it was like, this is what I want to do. And now, you know, between Belvedere and this is a standoff of my acoustic stuff, I think I'm hitting close to 2000 or more than 2000 shows. It does not get old for me. And I don't know if I'm just lucky that way or I just haven't been jaded like some others I, I, I've seen have, but it's still a trip to be from a small city in Canada and to play places like Italy and, you know, South America and people not only know your music, but have been, you know, following you for 20 years. It's uh, it's an amazing feeling and it's, there's no better, I don't want to say a job because it doesn't feel like a job, but there's no better thing I could be doing, you know, than that. You guys took like a, a seven year hiatus, right? How did it feel after that kind of break to get back into the Belvedere stuff? It felt good because it was awful to break up um, and it wasn't going to be a hiatus. It was, we were splitting up. Um, I went and worked on houses for a while and I, um, I was doing construction and I hated it. And pretty quickly I started this as a standoff with my buddy, John and Graham, who was the drummer at Belvedere. Yeah, let's just do this part-time. This will be fun, you know? And then we ended up doing like pretty full-time. We went to Europe, you know, a dozen times and put out three records. And so that's what I did in the break between Belvedere and this is a standoff um, in between when, when Belvedere broke up and when we got back together again. And then when we got back together again, it was just such a trip and everybody had gotten older and had kids and all this stuff and your perspective changes a bit. And maybe some of the things that, uh, you know, contributed to us splitting up really aren't that, you know, you found that they weren't as important. I have a 19 month old now. And mm -hmm. um, even with pr promoting shows, I'm a lot more selective, right? Like, yeah. how does the perspective change there? Like, wh what's it like? I don't know how old your kids are, but I have a little brother and mm -hmm. I always laughed. Like, I, I owned a music venue for a while. Thousand mm -hmm. person music venue, huge bands, everything. Um, yeah. Never impressed him a, an inch, right? Like, he did not think yeah. I was cool at all. He still <laughs> thought I was like uh, his lame older brother. Your kids think it's cool that like dad's in a rock band and stuff? Yeah, he's, I have, I have one kid. He's my son, Brody. He's, uh, he's five, almost six. 
and he's at that point now I'm noticing where things are a little cooler. Like he went to Europe with, with mom and grandma um, when he was about a year and a half. So he won't remember this, but basically they came and watched us play on main stage at Rose Rock. I'm holding them up there during line check and there's 10,000 people out there. And he's kind of like, you know, what up, you know, what's, what's up with this? Yeah. And, you know, but it, it was such a great, you know, time. And, and I was really hoping that as time goes on here, we'll be able to do more of that. You know, you know, I really want to bring him to Japan and I want him to come back to Europe. And so he's really, I can tell, like we, I did this sort of guest spot on uh, punk rock factory. They did a Disney album. And so I was singing this Moana song and like Rody from protest the hero. And I think kind of since then it's kind of like turned a corner, you know, it's like, Oh, dad does some fun stuff every once in a while. So, you right. know, we were out there skateboarding and he wanted to listen to Ray's fist, you know, and I was just like, well, my butt, you know, it was awesome. Right. I just, he's starting to kind of get the bands a little bit and you know he he likes the instruments and he's starting to play and he's like i want to play in a band too and so it's um yeah it's it's special that's pretty cool yeah it's I, i'm we're, we're at the the point now where we kind of just like differentiate songs and like he'll nod his head to some stuff which i think yeah is, is kind of neat he likes the menzingers strangely enough which is oh that's cool, cool. So, yeah so bad like religion that. was like the first band he sort of like got it a little bit you know like he was three yeah. i remember this and we were playing i was playing you know we're always playing music and stuff and and yeah bad religion was just sort of like it was melodic and it was pretty straightforward and he just kind of like rocked and he just was just rocking to it it was it was super cool cool and the other guys in the band they they have kids too at this point I'm, then I'm, I, you know, actually a couple of the guys left um, in the okay. last couple of years. And so, um, I, you know, partially because of that, um, just kind of hit that 40 wall and, right. you know, family first, right? So it's not for everyone. But uh, no, I'm the only one with the kids now. So everyone's got a couple of younger guys and everybody's pretty gung-ho on, on going for it here this year. You're you're putting new music out now. What what is what has changed for you writing a song? Have you, have you seen that uh, what you're writing about is different? what uh yeah. the message you want to put into music different um obviously everybody's shaped by life what what from your perspective has changed in your your writing since then yeah i mean you know when we first put out a record i was 19 and now i'm 44 <clears throat> and when you put out your sixth record i think you kind of start looking at things and going well you know i've just slowly been getting more socially conscious and more political as, as life goes on and especially having a kid you really start to put a lens over kind of what's going on and and um discrepancies in, in the planet so I figured if we were going to put out music I wanted it to be about something important so I did talk a lot about like the wealth gap and and how you know the average person is struggling under the weight of the system and and you know that theme runs throughout it it's not not every song is about that but um, I did try to shine a light on it that's that's super interesting especially coming from from somebody from Canada that there's still the the same thing going on up there I think people in America like have this like strange idea you know just because they hear socialized medicine everything up there is so different but you guys are are you know middle class feeling it the same as as us over here right yeah you know we do have socialized medicine to a point um, it's not full and and not everybody's treated e equal up here and so that is something I want very much for for people down south and a lot of my friends as well because in many places of, of, in western you know the rest of the world we do have that it's not just in Canada it's all over Europe and you know Australia and New Zealand and it, it just everyone it kind of you kind of beat your head a little bit kind of going like why can't this happen down where you are you know we do talk about you know the like I say sort of the wealth gap which is in Canada and which is everywhere right and it, you know especially when you get into other places around the world in South America and Africa and Asia where, where people are really, you know, have it, have it tough. And, you know, it's something that I think we need to continue talking about as, as a, a band that, you know, a punk band that I think it's important. And this, we can completely go past it because it's, it's a little bit heavier topic, but Canada has been in the news down here a lot um, yeah. in the last two weeks um, for the, um, not for good stuff, the schools. Yep. Yeah. It's I, terrible. I, I forget <clears> the, <throat> the exact name. Um, residential schools the re residential schools right yeah that was up until the 80s i think right that that, that was going on right yeah uh, 96 was 96. when they closed the last one so how terrible is that that you wow. know i was i was in college and this was still going on and like many canadians we didn't we didn't grow up learning about this stuff or if we did it was really glossed over and oh you know it was just like you know we were trying to help people like it yeah pretty shortly after that i started to realize more about it and it's something that you know you, you kind of, I think Canadian, Canada as a whole sort of has this, you know, like, oh, we're the nice, you know, nation and stuff. But I think genocide is genocide. And fuck, we, right. we, uh, they're going to be, this is the, the tip of the iceberg. And it's, and it's disgusting. And it's embarrassing. And it has to happen. And, and it has to be talked about. And I'm glad that people are hearing about it down there, because it's a, it's an awful piece of, you know, our history.
Yeah, I mean, and obviously we down here have our uh, many of you our skeletons. skeletons in our closets, right? To say, <laughs> yeah. to say the least, like the, the yeah. closet's overflowing. But that, like you said, I, I and I, I mean, we don't they don't teach us much Canadian history, right? Like yeah. learn about some fights on the great, on the great lakes and the French and Indian war is like what we right. get like um, that, like completely took me by shock. Right. Like it just wasn't uh, the, the pop culture picture of, of what I expected, but I guess everything, everybody has their own demons. Right. Or yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not like, it's not like it stopped in 96, you know, like look at, look at the, you know, our first nations and indigenous, you know, groups that are on the reserves and there's still people being kidnapped and, and, and indigenous women are going missing. And this didn't all just end in 96. And even you just saying the, the term Indian, that's so right. foreign to me because we don't call people that here, you know, like, yeah. and, and, but it's, it's much more prevalent in the States. So, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. A topic, it's a topic of conversation that like, I grew up right. with that term. Yeah. So I definitely and, grew up with it and, and very conscious not to say it, but like drilled into my head, like that's the name of that specific, yeah. specific war. That, that we like, like that's like seventh grade. Right. You learn about yeah, that war. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> no, no, 100%. Native yeah. Americans. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We call them Native Americans, 100%. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's just, yeah, and I'm not saying it. Oh, no, 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 100%. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm just bringing it up, but you know, it, it, it shows 100%. you like how much it's still ingrained in our system. And um, yep. yeah, it's messed up. And it's, you know, like I say, it's the tip of the iceberg. Like there's been five or six schools already that, you know, they're already finding more kids and stuff. And like how uh, it's, it horrible. breaks my heart. That's crazy. Terrible. Absolutely crazy. We move on to something a little bit uh, less Thank heavy you. here. <laughs> Close it out. Sorry about that. No, um, okay. Give us a, a rundown of what the rest of 2021 or or into 22 looks like for the band. Um, so yeah, we have about a hundred shows to make up in Europe and Canada, and so we're going to be hopefully doing that at the tail end of 2021 here and into 2022, probably up to next summer. And then after that, we're going to take a swing. I think fall of 2022, we're going to add on some stuff. I want to go back to Mexico or I want to go to Mexico for the first time. I want to go back to the States. I'd like to go back to Japan and South America as, as well. So, you know, that'll probably go into 2023, but yeah, we, we've got a lot to make up and, and we're excited about all of it. I saw you guys are with uh, Great Lakes Records now, right? No, that's Thousand Islands. Or Thousand Islands, I'm sorry. Not yeah, great, not great okay. Thousand, Thousand Islands, wow. So, yeah, they're out, they're out of Quebec and then yeah. Lockjaw Records out of uh, out of England. And they, um, they've they both been great. I, I, I manage a lot of bands and, and book bands. So I, I have a good relationship with both. And we have several bands like La Armada from Chicago is on there. Wolfric from, um, uh, from Edmonton is on the label. Drones from the UK. And so... Um, in addition to a ton of bands that I book from the States too. So there's a, there's a great relationship. Chaser is, is on Thousand Islands up there as well. So it's a, it's a great scene and they're good people and they work really hard. Super excited to hopefully see you guys when you come to the States. So, you know, I know who to call now when we're coming down to Pennsylvania. So yeah, you're swinging gotta... through the Eastern yeah. half. Like, let me know. We'll, we'll make something happen. That sounds good, man. It's nice yeah. to meet you. Drop uh, the socials real quick so that everybody can check you guys out. Social. I think it's belvederpunkrock.com or yep. on Facebook. It's it's facebook.com slash belvedere669 you guys on tiktok yet yeah unfortunately yeah. <laughs> Are you like, out there? i don't have time for the content and you yeah. know i just like we our our bass player he lives in toronto he's trying to do this stuff and like we do some fun stuff but it's so funny like you put out this stuff that doesn't have anything to do with anything and that's the right. stuff that gets traction then you put up stuff about your band and like you know five people watch it so i'm not sure about tiktok i might just leave it for the kids <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where I am. I can't, I can't figure it out. I can't, I can't uh, yeah. crack the code, you know, thank you so much for joining me. And thank uh, you. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing you over here soon and everybody go check them out. Belvederepunkrock.com.